Modern Death by Hater War Edge How We Learned Not to Resuscitate Part 2 The other patient right that came into question was the right to privacy. The Quinlan's lawyer, Paul Armstrong, argued that the state's decision to adjudicate the Quinlan's decision to withdraw their child from the respirator was an incursion on their right to privacy. The Quinlan's argued that by way of the right to privacy, they had a right of self-determination to decide whether to withdraw any extraordinary measures that would appear to be futile in this case. While not expressly stated in the Constitution, the right to privacy, and by extension self-determination, has well-established legal precedent in the law. In fact, in his judgment on the case Union Pacific Railway Company v. Bosford, 1891, Justice Horace Gray echoed the words of an earlier ruling when he stated, the right to one's person may be said to be a right of complete immunity, to be let alone. While the Quinlans argued that this right of privacy could be exercised by a parent for their child, the court disagreed, and argued that the state's interest in life outweighed the parent's wish for the respirator to be removed. But just like so much else in the Karen Quinlan case, this just raised more questions than answers. For at this point in time, no one really knew what a patient's rights were. Justice Muir's decision was a setback for the Quinlans, but it only strengthened their resolve. They realized that they had brought in front of the court a milieu so dense with the complexities of science, religion, and the law that expecting a lower-level court to rule on it might have been ambitious. As Karen lay in the hospital, without any further evidence of recovery, they went ahead and appealed the ruling in New Jersey Supreme Court. The public and the media continued to remain engaged with the case. Increasingly, the public sentiment was moving toward the Quinlan's position. The story had started off in a fairly straightforward fashion. Karen was the brown-haired, hazel-eyed girl, Snow White, she was called by the newspapers, who had fallen asleep, and now her fate was being fought over by her, adoptive, parents, her doctors, and the courts. Much attention was placed on her physical transformation. The picture that had come to define her was one from her high school, in which she embodied a wholesomeness that drew rampant interest in her ordeal. That picture, however, was dated, and what was available of her current state made for furious speculation. Her decorticated posture was frequently described in the court as fetal and grotesque. Perhaps the most vivid description came from Julius Corinne. A neurologist who at one point during his testimony described her as an anencephalic monster. Anencephaly is an exceedingly rare congenital malformation in which fetuses do not undergo the development of their brains. Anencephaly had come under focus recently after a report from Yale New Haven Hospital confirmed that several fetuses in their nursery born with anencephaly died owing to withdrawal or withholding of treatment after discussions with parents given the poor prognosis of these children. These fetuses are mostly present in anatomy labs in formaldehyde-filled jars, and sometimes make terrifying cameos in embryology textbooks. If you put a flashlight to the back of the head the light comes out of the pupils. They have no brain, added Corinne, to further spur one's imagination. Perhaps this only added fire to the public's curiosity, with the media realizing just how powerful an image can be to shape public discourse. Much of end-of-life discussions centers on pain and suffering. Descriptions that were vile, painting Karen in an inhuman fashion, were employed to amplify her suffering and to demonstrate how cruel it was to unnecessarily sustain her. It was no surprise that the Quinlans were offered $100,000 for a picture of Karen. Some reporters even tried to infiltrate her hospital disguised as nuns. The rules of optics also applied to the Quinlans. Very soon. They were able to tell their story most clearly by just being who they were, ordinary, loving, God-fearing parents who had turned their world around in the hope of seeking respite for their daughter. Flanked by priests, friends, and their lawyer, Paul Armstrong, they commanded a great deal of respect from the media covering the suit, who would always put an end to their cacophonous jostling when the Quinlans would start speaking. The doctors, too carried themselves with dignity and were clear about the patient being their first, and only, priority. What then was remarkable about this case was its complete lack of villains. Everyone, it seemed, wanted what was best for Karen.
which meant completely different things for those involved. In many ways, this resembled what so many complex ethical situations look like in modern medicine, where several well-meaning people see the same truth in very different lights. The close attention to the Karen Quinlan case gave everyday people a transcendent experience of what it was like to have a loved one stuck somewhere between life and death, and between being a person and something else. Everyday people read the newspaper not knowing what they would find out. They followed the Quinlans as they avoided swarms of reporters, went to court, all to hasten the passing of the daughter they so dearly loved. As the ordeal went on, and Karen's condition remained unchanged, thus, too, set in the despair, the weight, and the numbing pain that surely the Quinlans themselves were experiencing. For the media, the Karen Quinlan case demonstrated that readers and viewers were interested in death and that the appetite for this story had a human element of multiple, varying levels. From the smallest New Jersey newspaper to the cover of Newsweek, Karen was a daily fixture in print and on television. The quality of the coverage also varied significantly. The New York Times not only devoted its general assignment writers out of New Jersey and New York to the case, it also had its legal and religious writers cover it. Perhaps the writer who had the most expertise in this area was Joan Cron, who wrote a lengthy story for New York Magazine. What made that story so special was Cron's personal experience with the issue, she had had to make the decision to withdraw care from her 16-year-old daughter in 1968. However, much of the other coverage of the Quinlan case was distorted, either owing to a lack of understanding of the issues at hand or in an effort to drive up readership with controversy. From the start, the Quinlan case had been incorrectly labeled as a challenge to the legal definition of death. While certainly a hot-button and relevant topic, in the Karen Quinlan case, this was perhaps the only thing that all parties agreed on, that Karen was not dead, not by any present-day definition. Perhaps one notable absence also was the lack of any physician writers addressing the case in the mainstream media. According to a report by the Hastings Center, no medical writer covered the case. If that had been the case, hard questions about the significance of Karen's Eag might have been asked earlier, because it is medical writers, rather than legal, religion or general science writers, who have to date been most interested in and alert to the ethical implications of their species. Some physicians did weigh in on Justice Muir's ruling. In a Washington Post story that ran on November 24, 1975, Jackie Zimmerman, a critical care doctor at George Washington University Medical Center, not only stated that if Karen were in his hospital the doctors would have already removed the respirator, but said that the physicians themselves would have initiated the discussion much earlier than the several months it took for Mr. Quinlan to decide to raise that subject. Also criticized was Justice Muir's physician-centric view on medical decision-making, which seemed to be at odds with a statement published by the American Medical Association in 1973, in which their delegates stated that the decision to prolong life when recovery to normal functionality is not likely ought to be made by the patient and or his immediate family. According to Justice Muir, Physicians were supposed to be advocates for their patients yet they were duty-bound to protect and prolong life. Physicians, more than the patient's family and caregivers, were considered to be the most appropriate advocates for patients. What was not taken into account was that physicians themselves could have their own biases and vested interests that could be discordant with those of the patient. Therefore, unlike other cases, such as that of Kenneth Edlin, whose initial conviction for manslaughter after he performed an elective abortion in the sixth month of pregnancy was unanimously overturned by the Supreme Court, no official physician body ever backed the position of the physicians involved in the Karen Quinlan case. This was in spite of the fact that Justice Muir's opinion provided great autonomy to physicians to practice and enact life-altering decisions based on their personal codes. By January 26, 1976, Two months after Justice Muir's decision in the New Jersey Superior Court, the appeal process began formally in the New Jersey Supreme Court. Another two months after the arguments began, Justice Rich and Hughes delivered the judgment of the court in the landmark 7-0 decision in the matter of Karen Quinlan, an alleged incompetent. This court was cognizant of the matter placed in front of it and what the scope of its ruling might be.
The matter is of transcendent importance, involving questions related to the definition and existence of death, the prolongation of life through artificial means developed by medical technology undreamed of in past generations of the practice of the healing arts, the impact of such durationally indeterminate and artificial life prolongation on the rights of the incompetent, her family and society in general, the bearing of constitutional right and the scope of judicial responsibility as to the appropriate response of an equity court of justice to the extraordinary prayer for relief of the plaintiff involved as well as the right of the plaintiff, Joseph Quinlan, to guardianship of the person of his daughter. The facts had not changed much from when the case first went to the courts, but the climate was different. There was additional debate about what extraordinary measures entailed. Sidney Diamond, a neurologist and state witness, while noting that continuation of the respirator should be maintained unless the patient was brain dead, stated that it would be unreasonable to provide blood transfusions or perform surgical procedures in the present situation. The ruling also noted that the end of life landed at the intersection of law, medicine, and religion. While the religious beliefs of the plaintiffs were acknowledged and respected, the definition of life and definition of death were within the purview only of medicine. The ruling noted that in spite of this overlap, there was no conflict. In their conclusion, the court agreed with the prior trial court's views that Karen's present state did not amount to cruel and unusual punishment in a purely constitutional fashion, as her current state was not the result of any penal punishment, but rather a tragic turn of events. The court also agreed that while the Constitution allowed for free exercise of religion, it was not immune from governmental oversight particularly with regard to the preservation of life. It was Karen's right of privacy, though, that the court interpreted in a manner much different from the trial court. The Supreme Court opined that, given her poor prognosis, no external compelling interest could compel Karen to endure the unendurable, only to vegetate a few measurable months with no realistic possibility of returning to any semblance of cognitive or sapient life. This right or privacy had previously been cited in the landmark cases Roe v. Wade, 1973, and Griswold v. Connecticut, 1965. In Griswold v. Connecticut, the state of Connecticut, invoking an old state law prohibiting the use of contraceptives, arrested a Yale professor who had started a contraception clinic. The court adjudicated that the law violated the right to marital privacy with one judge calling it an uncommonly silly law. The Supreme Court also overturned the prior court's decision to bar Mr. Quinlan from being Karen's guardian. The decision to allow a parent to be the guardian was meant to use the family's best judgment of what option the patient would exercise were they competent and able to communicate their wishes. According to this judgment, the state's incentive for preserving life dwindled as the prognosis became poorer. One of the biggest differences between this opinion and the prior really lay in introducing the patient and the family member into medical decision-making. The prior court had stated that the anguish Mr. Quinlan would face might make it difficult for him to concur, which he was obligated to do, with the treatment plan of his physicians, thus making him an unsuitable guardian. Therefore, in sum, Justice Hughes affirmed in the 7-0 decision not only that patients have a right to withdraw or withhold life-sustaining treatments, but that that decision could be made by their guardians if they were not competent to make such a decision. The ruling also stated that no criminal liability lay on physicians for following such requests. Such was how the case that has had the most influence on end-of-life care was decided. And it was in the wake of this ruling that modern end-of-life care began its life outside the shadows and for the world to see. Criticisms of the ruling were few and far between. In a commentary in the Annals of Neurology, H. Richard Beresford, a neurologist, pointed out that by concentrating on the issue of the use of the respirator, the court dealt only obliquely with the more general question of whether there is a lower legal standard of care for non-cognitive patients than for cognitive patients. But this criticism was unjust, as the respirator was the only life-sustaining treatment presented to the court and addressing the overall level of care permissible under law for the care of these patients may have required a lot of hypothesis testing. Needless to say, the vast majority of physicians and all physician bodies welcomed the ruling. 
the New Jersey Supreme Court had made a brave foray into end-of-life care and presented to the world a template of what might be appropriate in these situations. After the ruling, the Quinlans went back to the hospital and had the respirator removed. Karen and Quinlan, far from not being able to tolerate coming off the respirator, lived for another 10 years in a nursing home, until she succumbed to pneumonia in June 1985. Her mother was at her bedside. While the Quinlans had instructed Karen's doctor to not give her antibiotics, they had her fed with a feeding tube throughout her coma. Joseph Quinlan, the man who had waged a national campaign to have his daughter removed from the respirator, drove several miles every day over the decade she spent in the nursing home to visit her before going to work. The true legacy of the Karen Quinlan case is still being felt, as it is echoed in court rulings to this day on a daily basis. Terry Schiava was 37 years old when she had a cardiac arrest at home, which left her in a persistent vegetative state. In her case, which involved the highest echelons of government, including then-President George W. Bush, Terry's husband and legal guardian wanted to remove her feeding tube, which he said was her wish, while her parents opposed that. The Quinlan ruling formed the basis of the courts eventually ruling in the husband's favor. But more than the courts, the case changed how care was delivered at the bedside and how physicians discussed grave matters with patients and their families. Finally, it started to become clear what the rights of the patient actually were. Beth Israel Hospital was built in 1916 by Boston's growing Jewish community, not only to provide care for the growing Jewish immigrant population, but also to provide employment to Jewish physicians who would have difficulty getting jobs at other area hospitals. After starting off as a storefront dispensary working out of a mansion in Roxbury, the hospital quickly grew on the back of donations by the local Jewish community, and it eventually moved to its present location in the heart of one of the most competitive healthcare zip codes in the country, Longwood, shoulder to shoulder with hospitals such as the Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Deaconess Medical Center, Boston Children's Hospital, New England Baptist, and, a bit farther down, Massachusetts General Hospital. Mitchell Rabkin was only 35 years old when a search committee nominated him to be the CEO of the Beth Israel Hospital, in 1966. He had little to no experience in administrative matters, but brought a unique blend of humanity and intelligence to the hospital. Over his 30 years as hospital president, surrounded by local behemoths, Mitchell Rabkin did more to make the medical system patient-centric than most. One of his lasting legacies was the formulation, in 1972, of the first-ever Patient Bill of Rights, which went on to be incorporated into state law. Among other now seemingly obvious proclamations, the Bill of Rights guaranteed patients the highest level of medical care regardless of their race, religion, national origin, any disability or handicap, gender, sexual orientation, age, military status or the source of payment. In August 1976, in the aftermath of In the Matter of Karen Quinlan, Rabkin published a guideline in the New England Journal of Medicine formalizing the process of deciding not to resuscitate patients, notwithstanding the hospital's pro-life policy, the right of a patient to decline available medical procedures must be respected. 51 While taking care of a near-irreversibly, irreparably ill patient whose death is imminent. The responsible primary physician might initiate a discussion with the patient and the family to withhold resuscitation after discussion with an ad hoc committee that comprised caregivers from other specialties as well as physicians not directly involved in taking care of the patient. The patient was required to be competent, in that he or she must be able to understand the relevant risks and alternatives, and not hindered by any factors such as pain, medication, or metabolic abnormality. It was also clarified that an order not to resuscitate would not result in any diminution of necessary and appropriate measures for the patient's care and comfort. Before the Karen Quinlan case and the subsequent ruling, according to Rabkin, whom I met for coffee, individual physician decisions ran the entire gamut of intensity, not only were there variable decisions, there were non-decisions. When faced with a patient unlikely to benefit from resuscitation, a doctor might tell his colleague, if the alarm rings, walk to the phone, don't run. Rabkin has a deep voice but a soft touch. 
When I asked him how the doctors in his hospital reacted to this policy, he told me, they found it relieving, because the decision was not going to be entirely theirs. Physicians would now have input from the patients, their surrogates, and their colleagues. Senior physicians were relieved in part because the house officers were not making decisions on their own, and the house officers were relieved because these were burdens. But the most important effect of this policy was that it brought end-of-life care out of the shadows. We put it on top of the table, said Rabkin, where it could no longer be ignored. In the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, another set of recommendations were presented which were not widely adopted. It was suggested that patients admitted to the ICU be classified on a scale of the intensity of treatment they ought to receive. The assessment of which classification to assign the patient remained the prerogative of the physicians and nurses, and the role of patients and their families in this was at a bare minimum in this document. If a patient or family member did have any questions regarding how they or their loved ones were classified, the responsible physician was advised to explain the treatment rationale to the person who raised the question. The Karen Quinlan case, therefore, had cleared the way for patients to officially consult with their physicians and institute do not resuscitate orders for themselves. In the event that patients were incapacitated and unable to participate meaningfully in this decision, their family members could make that decision for them. No longer would physicians speak down to patients from above the clouds as God himself might be imagined to, but would descend to the patient's side and actually reach an agreement after a conversation. Death has always been a wellspring for spiritual exploration and existential extrapolation. The unanswerable questions raised by our disinformation have found many takers among scholars, philosophers, theologians, and storytellers. Given that death is perhaps the most significant event that can occur in anyone's lifetime, all cultures have formed elaborate and complex rituals that center around the end of life, much like rituals centered around birth. Many rituals allow a time for reflection and healing for loved ones, allowing them to find support among each other as they mourn an irreversible loss. Medicine, too, is very ceremonial. When people come to the hospital, they get asked the same questions by countless different people. Physicians examine patients on rounds every day, not because they expect to discover anything new, but because that is something they do which only sometimes will yield useful information. The medicalization of death has led to the development of many modern rituals of death. When a patient dies in the hospital, the pronouncement itself is very ceremonial in nature. During my intern year, I was working overnight when a nurse paged me that one of her patients had stopped breathing. I asked her if she had called a code blue, but she told me the patient had not wished to be resuscitated. She asked me to come pronounce her as having died. Having never performed a pronouncement before, I asked my supervising resident, who gave me a checklist. When I walked into the room, the stillness was eerie. I followed the steps as they had been described in the checklist. I lowered the sheet from her face to reveal an elderly woman, pale as chalk with her mouth wide open and her eyes shut tight. I had never met her before. I searched for a pulse, and found none. I put a stethoscope on her chest and found her heart to be completely silent. Finally, to check whether her brain was functioning, I had to assess whether she was retaining any basic brain reflexes. I pried her eye open with my fingers. I poked the corner of her eye with my glove finger to see if she would blink. Nothing else I had touched felt like the moist, gelatinous, and perfectly still eyeball of a freshly deceased person. She didn't blink, and therefore the ritual, one repeated for anyone who dies in the hospital, was complete. Much like the overarching experience of patienthood, the end of life has been sterilized. For most of human history, death has been an intensely spiritual experience. Frequently, some religious figure, a pastor, or a shaman, would be at a patient's side at the end to help make it a deep and meaningful experience not only for the patient but for their family and friends. Studies show that most patients have great spiritual needs and many derive strength from their faith. These days, instead of a shaman, patients are surrounded by strangers in scrubs. Death, one of the most complex events that can occur in a hospital is usually handled by the youngest physicians. 
The most enduring ritual through the history of mankind when we are faced with the end has been to ask for a miracle. In ancient times, such a request would be directed to a religious figure who would go ahead with whatever incantation they had on their speed dial. These days this ritual is staged by doctors. For patients who desire everything, their last moments usually include a physician or nurse performing CPR on them, with the base of their palms, elbows locked. Such a scene can be quite grotesque. I vividly remember performing chest compressions on a patient who had been getting dialysis through a tube in his abdomen. Every time I compressed the patient's chest, fluid from his belly sprayed out. Very soon, my shirt was drenched in abdominal fluid, and the floor was so slippery that I feared losing my balance and falling face first on the ground. I had been performing CPR for way too long, and my shoulders, my back, and my wrists were about to give out. I looked across, and there were at least four or five interns standing in front of me, looking on as if they were watching Mufasa die in The Lion King for the first time. I tried to indicate to them that I needed one of them to take over, but none of them would, or could, oblige. Any physician you talk to will have such a story that refuses to leave them. Performing CPR on an actual patient, I learned many years ago is not the same as doing it on a plastic mannequin. In medical school, that was how I was first taught how to do CPR, and that is how most people learn. The vast majority witness CPR on television, where it is depicted as a wondrously effective mode of resurrection. In real life, particularly with patients in the hospital who are already very sick, it can look a lot different. Leslie Blackhall was a resident in internal medicine in 1987 when she wrote an article in the New England Journal of Medicine describing what she told me recently seemed like human rights abuse. When she wrote Must We Always Use CPR? The pendulum had swung fully away from the patriarchy of yore, everyone got CPR back then and we watched incredible suffering from this. Doctors were afraid they would get sued, or arrested, and some of them were if they refused to perform CPR. Apologizing for the graphic nature of her description, she told me about a patient she had to perform CPR on who had a tumor in the esophagus that was eroding into his aorta. His entire blood volume was pumping through his mouth. At other times, she described having to perform CPR on someone already in rigor mortis, the contractures a body undergoes long after it's been dead. While CPR would traditionally occur behind closed drapes, increasingly it has become a performance for family members to witness. Contrary to what was previously thought, families actually appreciate being able to see CPR be performed on their family member. When the psychological effects of such a sight were studied, to many people's surprise it turned out that family members had lesser anxiety and depression if they had been around to see that final Hail Mary enacted. 54 Yet that study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, had a secret weapon. After the patient expired, the researchers had a protocol that involved debriefing the family and helping them in their bereavement. Yet when a death occurs in the hospital, frequently the family is quickly forgotten. Between the dawn of time and only a few decades ago, almost everything we could do for people who were knocking at death's door was probably futile. The concoctions conjured, prayers professed and practices performed were likely highly placebogenic, providing a portrayal of an effort to undo the course of the cosmos. Physicians had as little control as their patients. Yet the advent of then radical interventions such as anesthesia, surgery, antibiotics, and mechanical ventilation all appeared to provide doctors an unprecedented ability to alter a person's trajectory, akin to yanking around a comet hurtling toward the sun. CPR, though, was the most dramatic of these interventions, primarily because of how dramatic a turnaround it could achieve. While CPR has now been established in the public imagination as a miraculous intervention that can pull people from the jaws of death, a different and troubling aspect has also emerged. CPR is increasingly performed in sicker patients, and as patients get sicker, the outcome of CPR gets worse. Patients who now get CPR are more likely to end up needing more mechanical ventilation and tube feeding and to experience more brain damage than ever before. More than four of five elderly Americans with a chronic disease who get CPR die before ever leaving the hospital again, 
and only 2% live for 6 months. And despite seismic advances otherwise, the past few decades have not shown any improvement in the survival of patients undergoing CPR. The reason people increasingly don't want CPR is not that they are afraid it will fail but that they are afraid it will only partially work. Patients are afraid that if CPR makes their heart start beating again, their brain will have to pay a huge cost. I was taking a medical history from a patient, a salesman for a car dealership, who started telling me about what he wanted in life. If my heart stops, doctor, just let me go. I looked at him and he seemed to be very clear and unwavering about his stance. There are worse states than death. This to me was emblematic of how in many ways modern medicine has come full circle. We started out doing everything we could to avert death, knowing that death was the enemy. In every medical decision and every megatrial, the only outcome that ever mattered was mortality. Along the way, though, in our pursuit to at best delay death, we have seen outcomes emerge such as vegetative states which are in many ways more horrendous and unnatural than even death. I remember I was working in the hospital when I overheard two nurses talking to each other. They had both been taking care of a patient who had been in the hospital for a while. What happened? One of them asked. She died, the other nurse told her. Oh thank God. Thank you for listening, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel.